Bronson, Norris, Stallone, D Douglas? Yeah, okay, he's better known for nose diving into Sharon Stone's pubic briar patch than dropping bad guys with a snub nose. It's never too late to find yourself in the unemployment line, but let's not mince words on the subject of 1989's Ridley Scott's celluloid symphony. Steeped in Tokyo neon and swimming in 80s synthesizer next to the testosterone kinetic Sherman tank that is Cobra, Black Rain may well be the most sleek, stylish, balls-out, unrepentantly 80s action movie ever burned to a piece of film. How unrepentantly 80s, you inquire? Watch and marvel at the inadequacy of the 21st century. Always to buy As I'm falling through the years As each dream disappears Night is full of tears I'll be holding on and yes, perched behind the Casio for this film's soundtrack is the omnipresent Hans Zimmer, at least two decades prior to forgetting the film soundtracks can have more than two fucking notes. Whatever orifice goes unpenetrated by the neon pink phallus of this film's opening, Black Rain's cover is ready and willing to fucking defile. Boss mullet? Check. Leather jacket? Check. Half-burned cigarette? Badass motorcycle? Aviator? Goddamn sunglasses? Check, check, and more check. If after beholding the majesty that is this box cover you aren't currently browsing Amazon to purchase this film, we cannot possibly be friends. How do you perfect perfection by opening up the film with a goddamn motorcycle race? As gorgeous as it is gratuitous, it contributes less than nothing to the plot, and if you dare to cut it out of this film, I will cut you out of the kingdom of man. Does Michael Douglas win? Irrelevant. The man monged on Sharon Stone's slash trap in her prime. He wins at life. Fuck the motorcycle race and fuck you too. After which, the following scene depicts Michael Douglas dropping his kids off after a court-ordered visit. But does this drain even an ounce of Nikki Conklin's badassery? Fuck no! Kids come from fucking broads, and Michael Douglas gets more gash than a manic depressive in a razor blade foundry. Unfortunately, children also mean expensive body disposal fee- uh, bills! Yes, but bills. So it turns out Major Mullet has been skimming what little cream he didn't leave inside Sharon Stone. We did the math, hero. You're at least a thousand a month in the hole. You're into the Shylocks you're taking. Hey, you want to charge me, okay? You charge me. You want to jerk off, you go back to okay, your office. We'll charge you. Someone will help us out. Nobody's got a softer center than a dirty cop. You want dirt? How you go to City Hall, huh? Okay, Police I Plaza. I mean, the whole I goddamn mean, system's yeah, falling yeah, apart and you're busting my ass? Damn it, you're lucky I don't confiscate your badge and gun right now. I'm telling you, Assy, you're skating on very thin ice around here. It sounds like the ice is problem. Nikki likes to throw the feds off his scent by cozying up at a mob joint where the only partner is greasier than his meal. Within minutes, the Yakuza stride in with a 9mm lesson in courtesy. After giving an old man a rub down, one of the mobsters reaches into his clothing and yanks out his short, stubby brown package. <laughs> the man's name is Sato, but from here on in, I shall be referring to him as Crazy Eyes. JESUS! Needless to say, Crazy Eyes promptly fillets the fucker like a sight of dog. Jesus, fuck, talk about unstable. Is this guy a mobster or a Japanese nuclear reactor? <laughs> Nikki and Charlie are having none of it, however, and proceed to plug in these motherfuckers. They make a daring escape of 20 entire yards before doing their best possible Nick Hogan impression. <laughs> Sato flees into a New York City slaughterhouse, presumably to escape the stench of hobo urine, with Nikki in hot pursuit. And Sato! Sato! His name is Douglas, not Carradine! Charlie shows up with the cavalry just in time for foreplay, and then... Come here, you little shit! Oh, oh my! Oh! Shows are gonna die! They haul Crazy Eyes in for murder, but before the inmates at Rikers can even assign him a bitch name, the Japanese embassy demands he be tried by the same Japanese justice system that allows Issei Sagawa, a convicted serial killer and professed cannibal, to walk fucking free. Well, shit! How could this possibly go wrong? Nikki does, however, secure the right to lug his ass back to Japan, along with the opportunity to do this. What happened, Nick? I don't know, man. I think he got a, uh, bit his lip or something. Seatbelt type, babe? 
before lingering on a camera shot so 80s it full on drops to its fucking knees and begs to be accompanied by a guitar riff. <laughs> Upon arriving in Osaka, the police promptly abscond with crazy eyes, or do they? Detective Conkren, I am Inspector Yamada, Osaka Prefecture Police. Nikki and Charlie leg it on over to the local station for an audience with the division chief, where the only police blockades are evidently of the language variety. Just hope they got a nip in this building who speaks fucking English. Assistant Inspector Matsumoto Masahiro, Criminal Investigation Section, Osaka Prefecture Police. And I do speak fucking English. Okay then. Given that the prisoner was never officially signed into Japanese custody, it turns out it's still technically Nikki's case, which cannot possibly be the way criminal justice actually works. On the main streets of Osaka, Japan, Nikki investigates a recent crime scene while Ridley Scott forgets he isn't filming Blade Runner. Superintendent thanks you very much. I've been ordered to I... take you to your hotel. I usually get kissed before I get fucked. <laughs> While Hans Zimmer reacquaints himself with his synthesizer, Nikki spots Joyce, or alternately, the lone character in this film who is in shot entirely in silhouette. You see, there's a war going on here, and they don't take prisoners. What are you talking about? Between Sato and an old-time boss, a guy named Sugai. Who knows about this? Counting you and me? Yeah. Eleven million. <laughs> Damn, that's almost an entire Mormon family. Which perhaps explains why upon returning to the streets of L.A. circa 2019, Michael Douglas has slipped into his moody pants. Let's go, Charlie, come on. Come on. You would have a long walk home. Why, if I get lost, we'll call a cop. Oh, was a that flirt. motherfucker! That lamp, oh, that one puckered up my butthole. With Nikki obviously being visited by his Aunt Flo, he and Chaz elect to meander alone down what has to be the only abandoned stretch of sidewalk on the entire Japanese mainland, at which point a gaggle of grown-ass men on flimsy fiberglass crotch rockets materialize from the mists of 80s special effects and drive around them in a semicircle, hooping like Xena Warrior Princess with Party City novelty flags flapping in the breeze behind them, before bugging out so quickly you'd swear they just attacked a naval installation. Apparently, Rageaholics, this is what a motorcycle gang looks like in 1980s Osaka, and to think people actually question Japan's masculinity. Back at the police station where competence goes to die, Nikki and Chaz spot what appears to be a SWAT raid in the making, and aside their belligerence, chain smoking, and complete ignorance of Japanese language and culture leaves them uniquely qualified to tag along. Busting in on a Yakuza bathhouse, Nikki spots a familiar dumpy, diaper bedecked homunculus from the airport and performs an interrogation as only he can. Hi, sweetheart. You remember me, don't you? Hmm? <laughs> How you doing? I only want to talk to the man. What are you doing? Five minutes? Hungry? That's all I want to do. I want to talk to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Master, I'm patient. Oh, fuck, patience. In the aftermath, they discover crisp currency from at least three separate countries, including U.S. dollars, you know, back when those were worth the paper they were printed on, which, upon palming a few from the table behind the chief's back while he's busy gargling with cement, it turns out is exactly what they're printed on. After which, he happens upon Matsumoto practicing his fencing, you know, for all those Japanese sword fights you so frequently saw in an 80s urban environment. I will have no more to do with you. You've dishonored me and our department. I saw you take the money. It's you and your self-righteous bullshit, man. It's gonna cost me my goddamn job. Hey, hey, I'm talking to you. If you pull it, you better use it. After explaining to Matsumoto and the Chief that the bills were phonier than Anita Sarkeesian's gaming credentials, this shit happens. You guys got a counterfeiting war going on, and you, pal, should talk to your partner before you go to the suits, okay? So fuck you very much. <laughs> Thank you. 
After a bar scene that's as painful as, well, as any evening of karaoke, Nikki and Chaz head back to their hotel, where Charlie remembers it's the second act of an 80s action film, and therefore, time for the protagonist's partner to die. You wanna play? You and me, come on. Come on, right here, come on, come on. That's it, that's it, come on, right here. Ah! Hey! Fuck! Good, Charlie. Fuck <laughs> me. Get my fucking passport! Come here, you fuck! Come here! Oh, Jesus Christ. The mysterious biker calls for reinforcements Velociraptor style, wherein it's revealed that the architect behind the code theft was none other than Crazy Eyes himself. And well, fuck the shit I said about urban sword fights, because I believe we can all see shit's about to get decidedly real. Get out of here! The surprise of the microsecond, Charlie's neck and skull have a parting of the ways, still somehow less violent than Charlie Sheen's last three breakups, and much like the aforementioned Estevez progeny, Nikki's solution is to crawl inside a bottle of booze, which is in turn located in a leggy blonde's vagina. Matsumoto swings by to offer his respects, and as a matter of Japanese tradition, offer him exactly one item of the departed's property, leading to perhaps the most blood dragon moment outside of playing motherfucking blood dragon. I can take anything I want. Anything. You are now pregnant with this film's child. I want to go back to Sato's hideout, okay? Just you and me. Back at the bad guy's hideout, Black Rain checks yet another box that all great action films must when it's revealed that the two warring Oyabun are holed up in a factory whose chief export appears to be hot lava, sparks, and murder. Tailing crazy eyes from the meeting, the home viewing audience learns that the only thing better than a shootout or a chase scene is a shootout that turns into a chase scene. <laughs> and I'm just thinking out loud here, but... Do bikers spontaneously erupt into flame when shot in the chest, or is that just an Osaka thing? <laughs> With Michael Douglas's attempts to corner Crazy Eyes coming up shorter than... Well, then Michael Douglas, he strikes a deal with the rival Oyabun to ambush and murder the shitbag as he returns from a Yakuza pinky sniffing. This, my friends, is when Black Rain takes a turn for the badass. Bye bye, Starry. And Japan is gone. No, seriously, handing Michael Douglas a shotgun, seven shells, and a license to kill is like handing Mel Gibson a case of smeared off, an SUV, and a Nazi armband. Why not just rename this guy's biceps Fat Man and Little Boy while you're at it? Of course, the guy's double cross soon becomes a triple cross when Crazy Eyes disguises his own agents as rice farmers in an attempt to take over the entire Yakuza. And then, shit blows up. <laughs> Sato flees on, you guessed it, a goddamn motorcycle. You know, if you consider a Suzuki to actually be a motorcycle. After a well-shot but otherwise lackluster motorbike chase that barely registers on our scale from one to death race, Michael Douglas thunders ahead and trips his candy-ass quarry for a proper hand-to-hand -hand confrontation that lends personification to the phrase, be careful what you goddamn wish for, Michael Douglas. <laughs> Like all Asian antagonists in Western films, Sato implicitly knows Kung fucking Fu. Oh, but you know, that shit ain't gonna stand. Rageaholics, I will now cease with a speech if I am, because it is goddamned imperative that you absorb Michael Douglas's comeback in all its keytar-drenched motherfucking majesty. <laughs> Michael 
Douglas pounds this ass hat like a black man in LA on a routine traffic stop, with the pendulum now swinging wider than Michael Douglas's balls and decidedly in Murica's favor, he grips the fucker. He carries him to a conveniently placed, perfectly impale ready spike and... Okay. Oh, you have got to be shitting me! You had this prick five feet from a pre-made Mortal Kombat fatality! Down, down, up, high punch, bitch! As someone who spent considerable time in Japan and speaks fluent Japanese, allow me to translate. Black Rain is the kind of cliché 80s action film in which all the partners don't die, the main character doesn't get the girl, and where the movie doesn't conclude with the antagonist exploded, impaled, or ground up at anything. Look, I won't pretend Black Rain is the finest film Ridley Scott has ever produced. It's no alien. It's no Blade Runner. But it's inky, painterly aesthetic, it's flagrant machismo, and of course the raw 80s style set it well apart from the rank-and-file action picture. Rock this movie like Michael Douglas rocks a mullet and fucking aviators. I'm Razorfist. Those up, you know, school to get you my 